I'm sorry. I'm oh, okay. Where's Jackie? Pennsylvania. Oh, oh, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the rain holds out today. Yeah, that, exactly. I know it's going to be a Last week, my uh, mother in law, Emma, was uh, telling me a story. And if I get the story wrong, you can correct me. But 2.30 2 in the morning, she's laying in bed in her, in her bedroom, and she hears a knock on the window. Knock, 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 knock. And the funny thing is this, this is the second time it's happened. And when she told me about it, I said, well, you, you got to call 9-11. And she said, well, if you call 9-11, what am I going to say? You know, is it a bird? Is it a squirrel? Is it the wind? Some teenage kid walking around playing a prank? Is it a bona fide burglar? Someone's going to do her harm? Or was it just a dream? Or maybe something she just imagined? Well, if you call the police, uh, what are you going to say? How do you describe something to someone that you can't see or that you've never seen? It seems like the, uh, the writers of the New Testament had that predicament. We've been uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, what we've learned about the Holy Spirit is that he is a person. He's not a force. He's not an it. Uh, he has uh, the personality. He has intellect, emotion, will. Uh, the Bible teaches that uh, the New Testament writers regarded him as a he. Uh, we also learn that uh, the, whole, the Holy Spirit is God. He's part of our great triune God. He's addressed as God in the New Testament. Uh, he has omniscience. He's omnipotent. And he's omnipresent. So he has all the characteristics of God. But the question is, how, uh, how are the New Testament writers going to describe him to people that have never seen him and they've never seen him either? So that's what we'd like to examine this morning. And we'd like to use as our launching point uh, John chapter 16. John chapter 16, of course, is part of the Upper Room Discourse. We're not going to do an exposition. Again, we won't do an exposition, but we'll use it as a launching point to try to understand how the Holy Spirit is described by the New Testament writers. So, if you've got your Bibles, open up to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Father, we thank you for your holy and righteous word, Lord. And uh, Father, as we uh, uh, grapple with uh, how the New Testament writers describe the Holy Spirit, Father, may we, uh, may we be enlightened by your Holy Spirit. For we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Last night, uh, last week after church, we were talking about the... the uh, all oh, the turmoil in the Middle East. And I was about to make a joke. I was going to say, well, <clears throat> I'm going to go on a hunger strike until they settle all the issues in the Middle East. And I thought that would be funny, but somehow it doesn't even seem funny anymore about what's going on in the Middle East. People are killing each other, and they don't even know why they're killing each other. And then last week we had this whole issue of this plane flying, this Malaysian plane flying over the Ukraine, and it's shot down. And all this destruction, and all this hate, and all this anger is filled up within people. And there's only one answer. It's God. The only way that you will ever have peace in the Middle East or anywhere is God. When uh, 
John the Baptist observes Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River, John chapter 1. He describes it as, the, uh, as a dove coming down from heaven. The dove is a symbol of peace. And you look at that and you, you can trace that all the way back to the book of Genesis. Uh, you remember uh, Noah uh, in the ark, and the ark comes to the rest of Mount Ararat, and uh, he sends the dove out to see if there's land, if the, the waters have, have, have receded enough where they can, you can get out of the ark. And ever since that time, the dove has been a symbol of peace. And so when, when, when John the Baptist sees the dove coming down on Jesus, it's a symbol of God's peace. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He's a symbol of God's peace. He represents uh, the peace that we can have with God and the peace that eventually will come with all mankind because of the Holy Spirit. It also represents the idea of beauty. Uh, the dove also represents beauty. He also represents the idea of, uh, of the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. He's from God. He is God. And he comes from heaven. So that's one of the characteristics. That's how he's described uh, by one of the New Testament writers. Uh, he's also described by the New Testament writers as wind. It, this is what Jesus says in uh, John chapter 3. He says, the wind goes wherever it wants and does whatever it wants, and you have no idea. And such it is with the Holy Spirit. And I was watching last night the news, and they were, they were showing, I don't know if any of you guys saw this, but, but the destruction uh, that came about uh, in Clarence last night. There was a couple people from Clarence walking here right now that might know the destruction. But some of the trees were uprooted, and it, the, the wind did all kinds of destruction, and uh, it just pops up. And they had, a, they had a meteorologist out with one of the commentators, and he was explaining scientifically about how all this happens, and the wind, what the wind's doing, and how the wind comes about. But both of them looked at each other and said, there's no way we can really explain how the wind works or where the wind comes from. And that's the idea of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some friends of mine, Howard and uh, Tara Cadmus, uh, they, they own Sweet Jenny's, and they're, 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 they're going to move Sweet Jenny's into the, into the old uh, red mill in, in, in the village of Williamsville. And Howard was putting up this tent, this 10 by 10 tent, uh, next, next to the, the red mill. And uh, he, was, he walked away from the tent to, to get something to secure it, and suddenly the wind picked the tent up, pulled it over the cliff and down into the ravine. And the tent is totally destroyed by the wind. And they're crawling down the ravine trying to get this tent out of there. And they're in the water pulling the tent up. And the, the crazy thing about it is it, they're in the background of a rock concert. The people are watching a rock concert. Then there's the musicians. And behind the musicians, Howard and Tara are trying to get this thing out of the, out of the water and trying to climb up the cliff. But that's the power of the wind. And that's what Jesus is saying. You can't control it. It's, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit. He has all that power. You and I have no idea how he works or what he's going to do, but he has power, and he's in control, and he will do what he wants to accomplish. That's the way the New Testament uh, writers describe his characteristic. Uh, but they also describe his, uh, his, his ministry. And... Uh, Jesus, Jesus alludes to it here in, in this chapter. He says in verse 13, chapter 16, verse 13, When he comes, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. He's described there as a servant of God. That's one of the characteristics, that uh, the symbols that, that people use to describe the Holy Spirit. He's the servant. And he, he, you, you think about this, uh, it, it's it, a perfect illustration of this comes from the book of uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 24. If you remember the story of Abraham, Abraham sends his, uh, his uh, chief servant, Eleazar, to go uh, procure a bride uh, for his son. So he takes the camels and all the accoutrements of, that he's going to need for the oriental negotiations that are going to go on. And he sends them away from the Canaanite people back to his former people to negotiate for a bride. So Eliezer does it. He obtains a bride. Rebecca brings him back, brings her back, and she is the bride for young Isaac. That's the picture of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is. That's his ministry, to provide a bride for Christ. 
to provide a bride for the Son. So the Holy Spirit then is as a servant. He's not speaking for himself. He's speaking for Christ. He's glorifying Christ, trying to get people to come to the point in life where they see the need for Christ and they become part of the bride of Christ, which is the church. So the Holy Spirit then is described as a servant. He's going into the business of just telling other people about Christ and making sure that they come into the fold and they will be the bride of Christ. Well, an another, another illustration, another description of, of the Holy Spirit comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you have been sealed for the day of, of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is described as a seal or a sealer. And we remember, uh, we've been studying the book of Revelation in, uh, in the Bible study, and as we remember, Revelation chapter 5 describes a scroll. A scroll is given to John on the Isle of Patmos. And John is upset with it because there's seven seals on the scroll that cannot be opened. They can only be opened by Christ, the, the Lamb of God. And that's the idea of the seal. The seal in the ancient world uh, put, it, it showed ownership of the king or some other prominent person and it could only be opened by him or under his authority. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's our seal. Nobody can take you, nobody can snatch you from God because God's Holy Spirit has got you in the palm of his hand. So he, 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 he seals us, he he, he procures the bride of Christ. He secures the bride of Christ, in, indicating that he's got you locked in his hand. And he's also our guarantee of our inheritance, as uh, he says in, in Ephesians, that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. Uh, we at Brick by Brick Bible Church, we, uh, we believe in the gospel of grace. Uh, saved alone by, saved for Saved by Christ alone, in Christ alone. That's the only way you can get saved. But after that, there's, there's, there's this idea of inheriting the kingdom of heaven based upon your works, based upon what you've done after you've become a Christian. And so what he's saying there, I think, is that, that, that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of our inheritance. Not only does he guarantee you eternal life, he guarantees your inheritance. All the rewards that you've been, uh, uh, that, that you've, that you perform works in order to obtain, the Holy Spirit guarantees those works. Uh, he, he is the, uh, as the King James says, he's the earnest. So you hear that word, the Holy Spirit is the earnest. Earnest is an ancient English word just meaning uh, serious. So when someone's earnest, they're serious. And so when, when the Bible speaks about him being the earnest, it means that he's serious about buying. Like you would buy a house and you would put that down payment on the house. And that's your earnest or your guarantee or your deposit. Well, the Holy Spirit is our deposit. He's our guarantee of our inheritance in heaven. So that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's to procure a bride for Christ and then to secure that bride and secure an eternal life and secure future rewards. So that's the, that's the way he's described his ministry. We've described his characteristics. We've described his ministry. And he, he also, he, he's... Um, the, the, the way the New Testament writers describe him to, they describe is how he equips us. The, 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 one of the passages, there's like four passages describe, just describe how he equips us. One of them comes from uh, Acts chapter 2. If you remember Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends upon the believers at Pentecost. And how is that manifested? It's manifested in, 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 in the symbols of tongues coming down on people. And the King James Bible says that they're cloven tongues, meaning they're divided up. Uh, it, it's a very difficult image to, uh, to, 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 to see, but it's, it's tongues. A lot of people think that it's fire coming down upon, uh, the, uh, upon the believers at the day of Pentecost. It's not fire. They're actual tongues. They're cloven tongues. They're divided tongues. But the description is as if they were fire. So fire it becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so that's how he equips us. And we, we, see, this, we see this imagery of fire uh, throughout the Old Testament. For example, fire connotes uh, the presence of God. If you remember uh, Moses standing before God uh, in, in, the, in the terms of, uh, of the burning bush, the fire pre represents 
the presence of God. So when you talk about the fire of the Holy Spirit, it represents the, the presence of God. It also represents the, God's, uh, God's acceptance. For example, in, in the book of Leviticus, the, the, the priest would bring out the whole burnt offering, and the whole burnt offering would be consumed by the fire of God, indicating God's acceptance of you. So the, when, when they speak of the Holy Spirit being fire, it speaks of his presence, it, it speaks of his acceptance, and it also speaks of his guidance. If you remember in the Old Testament, remember in, when, the, when the children of Israel are going to the desert area, there's a cloud of, of smoke that brings that they follow during the day and a, and, a, and a pillar of fire at night. So the Holy Spirit guides them. So it's, it's, it, when they speak of the Holy Spirit as fire, it's, it speaks of the presence of God, the acceptance of God, and, and the guidance of God. So that's one way of doing it. The other way, the other, another symbol of the Holy Spirit that's used in, in the New Testament is, is oil. And John uses it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. He says, because you have been anointed, you now know the truth. The word anointing means uh, to, to put oil on somebody, and they would anoint kings in the ancient world. When a king was uh, chosen to rule over people, they would anoint him with oil, or they would anoint a prophet with oil for his service to the Lord. Uh, we even speak of Jesus as being anointed, Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus, the anointed one, and then they translate that into Greek, so it becomes Jesus Christos. Jesus, the anointed one. So even Jesus is anointed. But the Holy Spirit anoints us but he, he, for service. But he also anoints us, or he's also that oil symbolizes uh, how God's Holy Spirit directs us, teaches us. And that's what John is alluding to in, in 1 John chapter 2, that the Holy Spirit will guide you in truth. And the symbolism of that is seen in the Old Testament where the, uh, there was always this lamp in, 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 the, in the sanctuary. There was one lamp with the oil, and the priest would come in, and that lamp would light up the area so that he could read the scriptures. So when it speaks of the Holy Spirit, and John speaks of the Holy Spirit as being the anointing one, he's anointing us in the sense that he's teaching us the scriptures, that if we follow the Holy Spirit, interpretations of the scripture, in order to find the truth. So the, 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 the anointing, it separates us from God's, the, the oil symbolizes separation from God's work and the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one that's ultimately going to teach you the truth. So that's two ideas. You see the, the fire, you see the oil, but you also see clothing. Uh, it's like the Holy Spirit is like a clothed here. He's, 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 he's giving us clothes. And that idea is seen in, in Luke chapter 24, where Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will clothe you from us. I used to love working for the post office. I, I really did love the job. But one of the great benefits of working in the post office was I never had to worry about what I wore to work. You know, at home I've got this big closet with all my Armani suits and my sport coats and my wonderful <laughs> shirts and, and ties and stuff. And I can imagine what it would be like getting up in the morning and saying, what suit should I wear today? Never had that problem in the post office. You just wear the uniform. But the uniform represents who you are. What you do, it's given so that you can work the job that's been assigned to you. Now, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but when I see a guy walking down the street and he's got that blue shirt on, he's got the eagle patch on, left side, and then he's got the stripe going down the side of his trousers, I know that guy's a mailman. I can tell by what he's wearing. But that's what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 24. You'll be clothed from on high, the Holy Spirit will give you the clothing so that when people see you, they will know who you represent. So that when people walk through this door, they will know us. They will know us by how much we love each other, how much we accept each other, no matter how much somebody has hurt you, insulted you, done all kinds of dirty, nasty things to you, you love them. Because that's how the Holy Spirit clothes you. So you're clothed on high by the Holy Spirit. Symbolic of, of who he is and what he does and how he equips us. Now the final one that, that, that we see is that uh, he speaks of the Holy Spirit as water, as water, as fountains of water coming out from us. That's how Jesus describes him in uh, John chapter 7. And uh, 
fountains of blessing will come out of each and every one of us when we're yielded to the Holy Spirit. And we look around and say, gee, we're not really important people. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of influence. We're not this, we're not that, we're not the other. We're not, we're not really that important. And I love what Dave Roper had to say in, on Tuesday's Daily Bread. Y'all don't read the Daily Bread. You really need to be reading that Daily Bread every day. But he had a great illustration on Tuesday. He was talking about watching this prominent big shot preacher speaking, and he's, you know, he just got turned off to listen to him. And I've heard that so many times that people uh, listen to big shot preachers and they, they, they boast about how great they are, how much <laughs> knowledge they've got, this, that, and the other. And they just turn people off. They seem so important, but nothing's accomplished through them. And yet, humility, no matter how much humility you've got, you can't, you can't have too much humility. If you've got humility, God's going to use you. Fountains of blessing are going to be produced by God's Holy Spirit through you. People that are arrogant or proud probably turn people off. They're not used by God very much at all. But people that are humble, people that are just doing what they should be doing are going to be a great blessing to God. That's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. When you yield to Him, there will be fountains of blessing that will come out of you. The book that we have, and uh, the books did come in today on the Holy Spirit, and uh, we got it for our Bible study. But uh, as, as we said last week, anybody that wants to follow along with the discussions, what, I, what, I, what I've said here this morning came out of Chapter 3 in Dr. Ryrie's book, and anybody that would like the book, we'll, we'll get one for you. But I read that book 30 years ago, and uh, Laura came, came by and gave us the revised edition, and it's quite, quite lengthy, it's much longer than when I, when I read it in seminary. And uh, one of the illustrations he used that, uh, in the revised edition, he says that these, these, these symbols help us to understand who the Holy Spirit is and how he can be described to other people, but they also serve as a reminder of the work of the Spirit. It's like when you, when you seal an envelope and put it in the mail, it reminds you of the sealing of the Holy Spirit. When you put a down payment on something, whether it's a house or an article of clothing, it reminds you of the Holy Spirit. He's a guarantor of, of your eternal inheritance. When you see water come out, you remind, it reminds you of, of the blessing of the fountains of water that will come out of you, etc., etc. All those illustrations that we've used today, the dove, the, the, the fire, they all remind us of the Spirit's work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your, your word this morning. And uh, our Father, we pray that uh, we'll be the kind of church that really does uh, yield itself to, to the Holy Spirit. That indeed, when people come into this church, they'll see something different. They'll see people that love each other, accept each other, and the people that proclaim the gospel and uh, are, are fearless but sensitive to other people more. And so we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will work in and through us, Father. We pray that we'll be ever more sensitive to just who the Holy Spirit is, Father, that we might be used by Him for the glory and the honor of our Savior Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen. So today's the big day. We have, we have 21 tickets. I don't know if we have 21 people who are willing to go, but uh, we'll figure it out. But we're going to have a...